Let's us have a closer look. What is inside one of the elegant MRI machines where there is a system of superconducting coils immersed in liquid helium? Uh, the winder here is uh, winding one of the drive coils for a magnet which will form the Helmholtz pair at the end of the system. Uh, we wind using rectangular wire. Uh, this improves the winding process, makes sure that every layered or turn to turn winds consecutively and stays in exactly the position we want it to stay in. A change from layer to layer. Uh, at this change we have to make sure we don't have any shorts or any uh, uh, electrical shorts. In this area we vacuum impregnate our coils. This is where we get resin. Um, we, we evacuate these chambers. Uh, we then fill each of the troughs with resin and then apply an overpressure to ensure that the resin is pushed down into the coils. We then allow the coils to set and this gives us one compound structure. These heat wires and I'm pushing polypenko over the top for insulation. This final moulded coil is the last piece of the inner magnet. All of these coils run in the same orientation with the current uh, and will be added to other coils which run in opposition to these coils. The peak field inside of this coil reaches approximately five and a half to six Tesla. Here we have a fully assembled inner of the magnet. Uh, as you can see, all of the leads that we saw earlier are all rooted now into one central place. These wires, all the black and red, are connected end to end via a jointing technique which allows a persistent current to run straight from one wire straight into the other wire. New materials like HTS, it's also very difficult to, not to make an electrical contact because to, to solder the silver together is a simple job, but to make a really superconducting contact with, with a pico ohm or less resistivity. If the superconducting coil of the given inductance is bridged with a non-superconducting lamp, the trap flux and subsequent superconducting current decay very quickly according to the equation expressing the decay time constant as inductance over resistance. This case is represented by a red curve. If resistive clamp is replaced by superconducting bridge, so the whole circuit is in a superconducting state and resistance is equal zero, the decay time constant tau has a very high value and the superconducting electromagnet is in a persistent mode. The following animation underpins the stages of charging the superconducting electromagnet bridged by superconducting switch, initially in normal state, followed by superconducting state after reaching the desired value of the flux density in superconducting electromagnet. Removal of the current leads in the final stage reduces the heat leak to the liquid helium bath. Now the, the MRI machines of Lotus C are stable. Basically the resistance in the magnet is so low that they will not decay within a thousand years or so. But in the beginning of MRI this was different. The, the superconductor was not so good, in particular the joints and, and the joint technology was not so reliable that all magnets were good enough. The difference between an LTS magnet and an HTS magnet is LTS magnets you can run them in persistent mode. You don't need a power supply. And for HTS magnets you will need a power supply in order to run them. And to do MRI or to do NMR you need an extremely stable magnetic field and this needs a very stable high performance power supply. And for HTS magnets we need new solutions like flux pumps again. What you see here is an, um, a very old uh, version of a flux pump or superconducting rectifier. And it contains several elements. Uh, first of all, the energy has to go somewhere, so that is a kind of a dummy load where all the energy goes. And then we have a transformer, uh, which is here. This is an entirely superconducting uh, transformer circuit. And the rectifier contains normally uh, diodes, and the diodes are then replaced by a superconductor that is switched from the superconducting to the resistance state. There is a magnetic field in the superconductor switched on and off. And that is only done by smart choices of superconducting material. So there is a niobium zirconium uh, material used as the material that will be switched. 
but then you can uh, apply a current of like 500 amperes to this load uh, while you have a control current of less than an ampere. This circuit's also connected to two further coils which we call the screening coils. These coils reduce the stray magnetic field of the inner magnet. Without these coils we would have large iron shields all around the room which are very heavy only allowing MRI magnets to be sighted in basements or on ground floors. So that shows a picture of a 70 hull body magnet. Um, the magnet itself is not actively screened, so without some additional shielding, the stray field goes out about 40 feet from the five gas lines, about 40 feet away from the magnet. It's rather a lot of space. So this picture shows the magnet in an early part of the installation and sitting inside. 400 ton screen room, iron screen room. And the purpose of the room is purely to contain the screen field. We've come up with some interesting new magnets which will show you how the whole technology of MRI magnets has moved forward. Um, the magnet we're going to talk about is the 7680, that's the bore in, in millimetres. The AS is actively shielded, shielded, zero meaning zero boil off. And because it's actively shielded, it doesn't need a steel room to contain the five gas slide. Here's a finished magnet. We now have the outer coils covered with a piece of copper. This copper forms a complete ring and is used when the magnet quenches to prevent a stray field burst. As the magnet quenches, eddy currents are generated inside this piece of copper which oppose the stray field burst produced by the rest of the magnet. If we have a fault during coil winding or into impregnation, the cost of scrapping a 20 kilometer coil is very significant. The superconducting magnet, once finished, is put inside this stainless steel helium can. Inside of this helium can will be at 4.2 Kelvin. Obviously, this needs to be isolated from the outside world. This isolation comes in the form of uh, a vacuum space, but obviously we need to suspend the cryostat inside of its room temperature environment. The suspension is obviously low thermal conductivity material and is attached at these four points on either end of the magnet. The helium cryostat goes inside of here. This is then shelled by a 20k thermal shield. This 20k thermal shield is then separated with the use of a vacuum space from an 80k thermal shield, both of which are attached to a Gifford McMahon cooler. Outside of the ATK shield, we have many layers of superinsulation, which acts as the final radiation shield before we get to the outside room temperature cryostat. We need to make sure that the adjustment of the thermal shields is correct so that we do not have any thermal touches from the ATK shield through to the room temperature. All of these systems are now complete and ready for acceptance. We ship our magnets to many parts of the world, including Taiwan, Germany, the USA, and Japan. We're doing a 77 electrical test, check everything after it's been nitrogen filled, before we take any further into helium filled. Superconducting magnets aren't confined just to solenoid magnets. We also have seed style magnets, such as this one behind me. There are two superconducting coils, one in each side of their own small cryostat. And then this large red section that you can see forms a C iron yoke. Uh, this, this iron yoke forms part of the magnetic circuit with the, with the field lines crossing from one pole to the other. This magnet has advantages over the solenoid magnets because it is open, so claustrophobic patients find it easier to enter and exit these scanners. However, they do have their limitations. The field strength of this magnet is approximately 0.6 Tesla. Open magnets struggle to go above this field strength due to their cost.